thanks so much for being here. I'm really glad to see some faces that are familiar and some new faces as well. I would love it if you'd put in the chat how you found out about this session so that we can make sure we reach other people as well. We're going to talk about SEO today and specifically uh, keyword research and content optimization. A little bit about me. I'm Tara Clays, and I'm the founder of Design TLC, which is a website agency that specializes in websites for schools, specifically independent schools, enrichment programs, and nonprofits. And I made this decision with my business a couple of years ago after being a web agency for 10 years to really decide to work on content and websites that I'm passionate about. And I am really fortunate and pleased to be able to do work with organizations that are doing good in the world and helping to enrich the lives of families and children. We are really passionate about that and that helps us do a really great job, I think, as well. I'm also um, really involved in the WordPress community. So WordPress, I'm pretty passionate about as well. I have several groups in the WordPress space that I am involved in and so I have a lot of resources there. And I just launched a podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago that you may have heard of. It's called Mindful School Marketing. I'm co-hosting that with Aubrey Birch, who's a fantastic uh, marketing consultant for independent schools. You can find it on iTunes and everywhere. I'm a mom. My kids are grown. They live far away. But I was a very active parent volunteer and have continued volunteering in my community. I think that's where some of this passion for helping schools and nonprofits has come from. I'm also a runner and a cyclist, and I'm a productivity geek. I love technology and tools, which is a great fit as well for what I do for a living and helping schools like yours. So let's dive into SEO. SEO, people will come and say, I want my website to show up in Google searches. I want to come up higher. How can I do that? And there is no magic pill for that. It's really about your content. And as years have gone on, that has changed substantially in terms of what Google can understand about your website. But ultimately, SEO is about the content on your site. Great content, content that's relevant to what you do and to what people are looking for, that's going to naturally and organically help you come up in searches. Google uses what they call EAT. It's a strategy for how they set up their algorithms, which are changing all the time. You may have heard that. So optimization means making something the best it can be, and EAT is how Google tries to achieve that. So the E stands for expertise, which is what we're going to talk about today, and that's related to keyword research and the content optimization, the optimizing the content on your site. Also, the authority is the A, and that is link strategies and mentions that you have on other websites so that Google knows that your website is authoritative, that it has some authority. Authoritative sites like Wikipedia and Yelp are going to come up high in searches because Google knows that millions of people visit those sites. And so that helps them have authority. And then trust has to do with reviews mainly. So getting reviews on Google, but it also has to do with some technical things within your website and having a privacy policy, things like that, that make your website trustworthy. So we're not going to really talk about those other things today, but I wanted to mention them because SEO is not a one-step process and it's not a one and done thing. It's an ongoing process. So as I mentioned, we're gonna to talk today about the, the E portion of EAT, which involves research and content optimization. So starting with research, we're gonna be looking at how to, how to research keywords for your website. And a keyword is an SEO name for a search term that you wanna rank for. But it's important to note that just because you want to rank for a term doesn't mean you will. There's no form that you send into Google that says, here are the terms I want to rank for, please rank me. That does not exist. And also, even if you do the optimization techniques that I describe for a keyword, it doesn't mean you're going to come up in a search for it. It's not something that you have a ton of control over, but you have a lot of ways to try to influence it. So while we're going to learn how to use these SEO tools on your website, first we need to talk about the keyword research process because it's kind of like priming your walls for paint. If you, if you don't do a good job getting everything ready for that paint, it's not gonna stick and it's, you're gonna be wasting your time. So as a private school, you wanna research relevant keywords that are related to private schools or independent schools, but not just the word private school because lots of people, lots of things have private school as a word related to what their content is. 
So we're going to talk about the research and the analysis that are going to help increase the chances that you'll be found for some of these keywords. The first step in this process is understanding your audience because that's the person that you're trying to reach and satisfy. So if you're a school with a strong athletic program, you might think about terms, put your, yourself in the mindset of the parent that's doing the search. So if your child plays lacrosse and you're looking for a private school that has a good lacrosse program, what terms will you use? You're not just gonna type private school and you're not gonna just type lacrosse. You're probably gonna type some kind of a phrase into Google, private school, good lacrosse program, best lacrosse private school. Think about how you might word that. Those are terms that a family might use to find your school. Private school with four children with learning uh, differences. Think about longer term words that would be used to describe your school. And also that will be used to solve this parent's problem. When you go to Google to do a search, you're trying to solve a problem. You're trying to answer a question. So it's a really sort of intuitive process, this part, first step. Keyword research involves making a list. So you're either going to write down keyword ideas or put them in a spreadsheet. I'm kind of, I mentioned I'm a, a geek. So I'm a spreadsheet geek <laughs> and I have a spreadsheet. I'm gonna put this in the chat right here. And you can go to that spreadsheet if you want to now or anytime later and you can make a copy of it and you can utilize this uh, spreadsheet for your keyword research. It's a very simple, straightforward spreadsheet that I think will help. So you're, it has four columns in it, actually five columns, but there are four that I'm showing you here to start out. And the first one is these sort of top of mind ideas that I talk about. When you think about, put yourself in the mindset of these parents that are doing the search, what are some things that you think they might be using? You can come up with probably a hundred if you really spend time and just keep going back to it. You can also survey people when they come to your open house. How did you find us? Do you remember what term you used? So you're gonna fill out this first column with these blue sky sort of brainstorming ideas that are just based on your own intuitive judgment. And these are really, this is a really great source. There are also some tools that you can use. So Google has free tools. It's part of Google. One is auto-suggest. If you've ever noticed when you start typing into the search bar, Google is gonna guess what you're going to be looking for. They'll guess the answer to your question. It can be really interesting sometimes to see what it thinks you might be looking for. Google is scary that it knows so much about you, but if you start typing in private school or some terms that you think are worth considering, you might get some more ideas from this auto suggest. And you're gonna add those to the column in the second column in that spreadsheet. Also in the second column of the spreadsheet, you can utilize Google's related searches, which is what shows up at the bottom of the search page of page one after you do a search. At the bottom, it will say, here are some related searches. This is gold because it's giving you other terms that Google knows people are using that are related to what you just searched for. And just keep in mind again, that it's not just one word, even though we call it a keyword, it's really a keyword phrase. 70% of searches exist as long tail searches. So that means they have long tail keywords. There are phrases that have several words in them. So consider that when you're doing your keyword research and your lists, that it's not just one word or two. Okay, now this gets to the really fun part. If you have another window open, you're welcome to go to this website now. It's free to use. You have a limited amount of use that you can use per day. So you could use a couple of computers if you want and try to cheat the system, but it's Uber Suggest. There are several different keyword tools that you can use and some of them you pay for. And some of them are free like this for a certain amount of time, a certain amount of searches per day. So Uber Suggest is a tool that we uh, share with our clients because it is free and it's really easy to use and it has great data. And data is the next portion of what we're going to be talking about. We're going to do a little bit more diving into some keywords first. So you can do a few different things with Uber Suggest. You can inspect your own website. So you may not know what, where you rank currently. Uber Suggest lets you put your domain into the search bar and you can, it will spit out for you what you currently rank for. So you can see the terms that and what position you're in for those terms. Take those words and put them into that spreadsheet. 
you can copy these and export them to a CSV file, and you can um, then import them into that spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is going to be your friend here because we're going to do some really cool stuff with it. So you're going to look at your own website. You're going to take those words and you're going to put them into that column for your website. Are you in the uh, copy of the spreadsheet? Any of you, do, do you have that open? I'm looking in the chat. Okay. Next is, next is the competition. So the same way you just put your domain in, you can put in the domains of other schools near you and you can see what they're ranking for and maybe get some more ideas there. So you're gonna then take that list, you can pick and choose, you can export the whole entire list. There will be hundreds and you can put them into the competition column. So now you've got your brainstorming column, you've got your Google free um, auto suggest and related search column, you've got your own current website column and your competition column. So that's all great information right there and you probably have more words than you have pages on your website. But there's more. So we're going to then use Ubersuggest because Ubersuggest will also give you some ideas. So when you are in Ubersuggest, you can go and you can put in a keyword, let's say private school, and you can actually put in the city. And this is really important because as schools, you want to be looking at your search data for your area. To not really, it's not going to be fair to try to rank for, you know, independent school or private school near me nationally. That's not really helpful information for you. You want to be ranking for it where you are. And Google knows that. You don't have to have near me, but Google knows where you are. So when you do this search, you can put in a city or the nearest city or cities and look at this information there. So Google will then show, or Uber Suggest will then show you underneath your word, other words that are similar that you might try to rank for. So you can then take this list again, export it and put it into your keyword idea sheet there. I wanna mention something here. And that is that once you do this, you'll see there are a couple of other columns next to those words and it shows you volume and SEO difficulty. It also shows you CPC, but we're looking at volume and difficulty. And the first thing we want to look at is volume. So if you notice here for private school, the volume in Arlington, Virginia is 140. That's about 140 searches per month. And the SEO difficulty is 22. So what does this mean? Well, let's look at independent school near me in Arlington, zero. So I might think that independent school is what I am and that's the term I want to use and be defined by, and that's great for you, but it's not great for Google and for searchers because according to Ubersuggest's data, which comes from Google, nobody's using the term independent school. So it's gonna, this is that primer concept here. If you don't do this first, you could be really wasting your SEO energy by trying to optimize your website for words that have really no search volume. So that's why we're doing this research is to get this data. So we have this list, we put the words in here and we're getting that search volume information. After that, we're looking at the SEO difficulty. And that's important because a term just private school is very competitive. It's gonna be harder to rank for that because it's gonna come up in Yelp and Niche and grade schools and all the, a lot of other very authoritative sites will be ranking on the page one. So you have a very low chance of ranking for that. So we wanna find a balance between keywords that have some search volume and keywords that have a reasonable chance of us ranking for. So then what you can do is you've got this spreadsheet, right? We've made this spreadsheet with all of our words and the columns that we have, and you can then kind of look over it and you can eliminate words that sort of really are not relevant to your school that you can't see that you would ever use that term on your website. You can take those out, but then you have all of these words now, maybe hundreds. You can take that list and you can copy it. And if you create a free plan in Ubersuggest, you can actually import a list. So you can take all of those words and paste them into Ubersuggest. You can choose your location and then you can, it will spit out for you a chart that kind of looks like this for all of your words that you can then export and import into the spreadsheet. 
And what I've done here, if you don't know how to import into, Goog into a Google Sheet, you can create a new sheet and go to File and Import. You can import your CSV data, and then you can paste it into the tab that I made, which has conditional logic. And what that will do is it will turn, I think the sheet that you have, it's actually opposite of this, it's green and yellow, but it will actually turn anything that has a search volume over 10 and anything that has a difficulty under 31, it will color code those for you. So you can identify at a glance which keywords pop out that you should be considering. So then you have that list, you've got this data, when you've got these identified, and then I have a column there where then you can say, hmm, I think this term might be good to try to use on our about page. I could see this word coming in to play on a page about our, our athletic program, about our arts program. So you can then assign pages. This is for your own purpose. Again, Google doesn't get this information. You can assign your page to your keyword. So here we've laid a great foundation. On your website now, we've done our homework and we've got this information, this really valuable information that is based on data. And we can start using that within our website. So whether you have WordPress or any other website platform, what I've talked about up till now completely applies to your site as well. And even what I'm gonna talk about next does, which is the structure of your website page. So. If you've worked on your website, you've probably seen H1, H2, the opportunity to structure your content on your site. And many people think that this means that H1 means it's a big headline and H2 means it's a little bit smaller and H3 means it's a little bit smaller than that. And that's pretty much true, but, you, but it's absolutely not what H1, H2, H3 are for. H1 is the title of your page and there should only be one H1 on every page of your website. If not, you're gonna annoy Google and maybe get penalized by Google and confuse Google. So H1 might be what you want every heading on your page to be 36 pixels and pink, and that's what H1 is styled as, but that's not how you style it. H1 is for Google, not for your style. So you can change the style of your H1, but you wanna only have one of it. And then after that, then it's hierarchical. So H2, H3, H4, you can have several H2s and H3s and H4s. And, and it's basically, this is how Google is understanding what's the most important information on your page and what is your page about. So we've identified the page title and then the content. So now that we understand what those are for, we wanna make sure we're using the keyword within this. Okay, so you want to use your keyword within your headings and within your text and not overuse it and not use it in an unnatural way, but you want to try to go back to that keyword list and you've assigned it to this page and use it naturally in your title, in your subheadings and in your content. You also have a great opportunity to use your keyword to identify your images. So it's really important, not just for Google, but also for accessibility for people who use screen readers, that you assign some text to your images because people who can't see the image, Google can't see the image, they can read what the image is about. And that's an opportunity, again, to use your keyword. Now, here's an example in WordPress, when you put an image in, there's a little box where you can assign the alt text. That's the description of your image. You can use your keyword there. I would just caution you to also make sure that what you're using is descriptive of the image. So in this case, I wouldn't say, this is a picture of a school building for a Spanish preschool. That is not what this is a picture of, right? So you want it to be also true. The next thing that you can do with your website content is to pay attention to the permalink or the slug. This is what the URL, the identifier for your website page is. So you can also use your keyword here. It automatically, most website platforms will make this the same thing as the title that you assign to that page, but perhaps you want to change it. You can make this have your keyword in it. So if I'm trying to optimize for summer camp, that's what I want my slug to be. Just a little note of warning here. If you have a page that exists, and you change this slug, 
you want to make sure you do something called a redirection because what will happen if you change this slug is that Google will find an error because they've already indexed what it was before. So your page title, that H1 within the content, you can change that all you want. But if you change this permalink or slug, you want to make sure you do a redirect. But this is another place where you can utilize your keyword. The other way that you can optimize on your page, optimize for a keyword, is to use it within your links. So when you're linking from one page to another, if you're linking to your summer camp page, you want to use the word summer camp on the other page that it's, that's linking to it. It's oftentimes you see click here and that's what you click, but that isn't telling Google what that click is for. So it's not telling Google that there's a link on your site about summer camp. So you can say click here for summer camp, but you want to make sure you have summer camp in the actual text that is part of the link. Does that make sense? Yes, Okay. All right, now we're getting to the nitty gritty and we're gonna get into the Google, the uh, WordPress tools. So meta descriptions and SEO title, this is what comes up when you actually do a search in Google, right? This probably looks somewhat familiar here. We have the, the slug, that top black line, and then we have the purple, which is the SEO title or the title of the page. And then we have a description. This will automatically be generated on, on any website platform using what has been assigned as the title and what has been, thanks, Debra, we'll send you a recording. And then what maybe the first sentence is that will turn out to be the automatic Google search result. But that might not be ideal for you and it might not contain your keyword. So there are tools that will allow you to customize this and you wanna think about how you want it to be worded and what you want it to say. There are a couple of free tools that you can use that are similar to each other. I like both of them, but here's where you can test out and see what it would look like to have a specific SEO title and meta description on your page before you actually implement it. There's a certain length that you can have and it's 155 characters for the meta description, I think, but you can actually put your website page into this and click the fetch button and it will show you what your current SEO title and meta description is on that page. So it's kind of cool. You can see what your current page looks like. The tool on the left, which is um, part of Mangools, which is a set of SEO tools, does a really cool thing also where it does a heat map and it shows you what people click on on your uh, search result, which is also super fascinating if you have some time to look at that uh, to see what people are clicking on. So you can use this to sort of give a little test run and also see what your current pages on your current website look like right now if you want to. So I'll give you a second to make notes, serpsim.com. Okay, so the other tab in the spreadsheet that I shared with you is then what we use to keep track of and identify the meta description and SEO title for each page. So we've on the other spreadsheet tab, we identified the URL that's getting mapped to each keyword. Here we take the page and we list the keyword. And then we also put in the SEO title and the meta description. And I have a cool little character counter here that shows you if it's too long or not. Once you have all of this research done, then you can go use a tool on your WordPress site. Other platforms I'm sure have similar setups WordPress, there are several plugins for WordPress that are great that do SEO. Uh, Yoast, All-in-One SEO, SEO Press, and Rank Math, they're, they're all very similar to each other. Yoast is among the top plugins used on any website in the world. So we use Yoast most often. SEO Press has really gained a lot of popularity, so we're trying that one out as well. These are free to use, and there are some premium versions of them as well. But what this allows you to do is it's a tool. So it will identify for you some opportunities and some places where you're missing out on optimizing once you tell it what keyword you want to rank for. So a lot of people think they're gonna put this Yoast on their website, they're gonna turn it on and it's gonna optimize everything and Google's gonna find you. And that's not at all what the case is. You have to do the keyword research and you have to tell Yoast what the word is that you're trying to optimize for on that page. 
you can actually on premium versions, you can have more than one keyword on your page. Obviously, you have hundreds of words on your page, most likely. So for Google to only pick one phrase out of all of that is, is not realistic, but that's the one that is the most important to you. So Yoast allows you to do a lot of things and it will go back to what it does on the single page. So all of these plugins have some kind of a configuration and setup to help you just as a basic foundation, set up your website for searches. Uh, Yoast calls it a wizard. So when you first install Yoast and, and activate it, you can go down and go to the general settings and it will walk you through some steps where you identify what type of organization you are, different things that will help set a foundation in, in all of the search results that Yoast helps to create for your website. So you can go into the website tools here and, and you can identify if you want to, you can connect, help connect to Google Search Console, which is a whole other thing to talk about, but Google Search Console is the tool that you can use to help connect your website to Google and help it index the pages on your site. So Yoast will help you make that connection if it's not already made. You can also add in a, a code for Bing and these others, Yandex and Baidu, which I don't use. And then you can also get a site map from Yoast as well. This is all in the general settings of Yoast. Under search appearance, you can identify how you want your search results to automatically out of the box show up. So if you've ever seen in an SEO title when it shows up in that Google search, it either has a vertical line or a dash between the page title and the description, between the page title and your organization's name. So you can identify that here. You can put in your logo and talk about what kind of organization you are there. Also under search appearance, you can tell Yoast what the default is for a meta description. So let's say you have 150 blog posts. You're probably not gonna take the time to go in and optimize each one of those, but you can tell under posts, you can tell what the default is, what the default meta description is so that anybody coming to a post on your website, instead of getting the first sentence of that post, they can get a description of your school in general. You, or you can also um, customize what shows up in that SEO title section. You can do other things as well, identify which archives you want to show up in searches or not. So for example, author archives on a school website probably isn't something that you need to have. You don't need to be able, people to be able to do a search and find all of the content that you have created or that your director has created or something like that. So you can disable certain things to not show up in Google searches. Social, you can actually control what the default is that shows up in Facebook and Twitter as well. So if you've ever seen sometimes if you've tried to share a page or a post on Facebook and it's got some weird image that has nothing to do with what you want, here you can actually control what that default is. If there's no image on your page or post, then Yoast will tell Facebook this is the image to use. Okay, so when you get actually into the page now, now we've done all the configuring, now we're back to our page or our blog post, and we're optimizing for that keyword that we've identified for that page. So we put the keyword in over where it says focus key phrase, and then Yoast will actually tell us with a color coded system how well we're doing. And we can actually open up and see how we can improve on that. People get obsessed with this green light. Everybody wants the green light in Google, but what I'll tell you is that a green light doesn't mean you're going to get found in Google and a red light in Yoast doesn't mean you won't get found in Google. It's really a tool to help guide you and help teach you. So when you open up the analysis that it shows you, and it does this also for reading, you'll see there's the SEO analysis and there's also a readability analysis. So it will tell you if you're using the passive form too often, that type of thing. But here it will tell you, well, you should be using this in the key phrase introduction. So again, you're gonna use, use the key phrase in the first paragraph of your content that will help Google understand better what your page is about if you want it to be about that keyword. So it will give you all sorts of guidance here on how you can improve your post. 
but you don't want to make your content not relevant and not natural. So take this with a grain of salt. And sometimes just changing one thing, just putting an alt text on an image will change you from a yellow to a green light. Okay, so you've done all of this. Now you've optimized 10 pages on your site. And so what? How do, what do you do after that? So I think it's important to note that SEO is an ongoing process and it's something that you need to pay attention to. And if you really are trying to have some success, you want to keep track of this. You can use Google Analytics, you can use Google Search Console, and you can also use some other tools to see where you rank. You can go back to Ubersuggest in 60 days and see if you have improved on what you saw when you first started. And hopefully if you've done this, I can almost promise you, you'll see some growth. And the last thing I mentioned, local search. And I, I know we were just talking about keyword research, but because your schools, I think it's important to note that you want to make sure that you're on top of your Google My Business page. So that's part of the, of the authority and the trust in that eat, eat ranking qualifier that Google has. So you want to try to make sure that you have reviews. And I know sometimes Google My Business has been cruel to schools and not showing reviews. And sometimes if they do show, it's hard to know um, what Google decides from one day to the next. But it's not just the reviews. It's also your Google My Business page. This is part of Google's algorithm. They're looking at your Google My Business page. So you also don't want to forget about that as part of your strategy. And I think it's important to mention that for school SEO. All right, rolled through about a half an hour of basic information. And so I'd love to answer questions. And I'd also be really happy to, to open up a screen share of a live site or of Uber Suggest and do some work with you if you like. But before I stop this, I wanted to just let you take a moment to screen share these two QR codes. So the first one is that I mentioned we're going to do another Lunch and Learn in May. 